Hello, my name is Andre Ward and I'm the Associate Vice President of the David Rothenberg Center for Public Policy at the Fortune Society. Welcome to Both Sides of the Bars, a discussion-driven show that examines the legal system from various perspectives, including people most impacted by the legal system. We discuss critical questions about how the current system works, its intersections with social justice, and we highlight the efforts that are being made to improve the lives of everyone that's affected. We ask you, the viewers, to spread the word about both sides of the bars and share your comments with us on Twitter at thefortunesociety.soc. Today's show is really interesting in that we're going to be looking at the year-end review and the road ahead. And so in 2022, you know, it's been a year of significant change within the criminal legal system and within the criminal legal system reform movement. In the first two in the first of the two episodes, the panel of experts will look back at 2022 and discuss where we are now and where the criminal legal reform world is heading in 2022. Some of the topics that we'll explore with our amazing guests will include bail reform, fear mongering in the media, Rikers Island, mental health in jails and prisons in the US, and what do the midterm election results mean for the criminal legal reform, both nationally and locally? Our guests today include Scott Hetchinger, who is a civil rights attorney, longtime public defender, and the founder and executive director of Zealous, which is a national advocacy and education initiative working to topple the historic imbalance of power over criminal justice media and policy. And also who joins us is Olaya May Oloran, and she's a movement lawyer, political commentator, writer, and abolitionist thinker. Oloran is a Bahamian, a Bahamian, a Bahamian, but she's a Bahamian Nigerian and was born and raised in Nassau, the Bahamas, where she lived until she moved to America in 2008. And she received a Juris Doctor degree from St. John's University School of Law, her BA from Ohio University, where she studied political science and African American studies and law, justice, and culture. She's a public defender at the Legal Aid Society and just been involved in a ton of different acts as it relates to examining policy amplifying the needs of those impacted by the criminal system and ways in which people can get involved in joining those efforts. And as a public defender, um, Eli May believes that advocacy must extend beyond the courtroom if we want to shift social consciousness and create real change. And so thank you so much for joining us today. We have joining us today, Eli May and Scott. How are you both doing? And thank you so much for joining us today here at Both Sides of the Bars. Great, thank you for having us. Totally. Really excited for this because each of you are leaders in your respective rights and continually um, move the dial and the needle around ensuring that people are aware of what's happening in the criminal uh, legal world in that way and ways in which people can get involved. And so I just want to thank each of you for your continued efforts in raising awareness and being in action um, with challenging systems that ultimately and invariably harm people in different ways. So I just want to jump right into it, right? Because I'm excited, right? And we want to get into this show. And I think one of the, the things that's come up, you know, we're here in New York City and fairly recently, as of yesterday, we learned that there was a 19th person who died on Rikers Island. I think as a starting point, just talk a little about Rikers Island, like that history, um, like where we are today, what needs to happen on Rikers Island as a part of our reflection and what's going on within the year of 2022. And we can start with either of you, it doesn't matter. I, I'll go. Well, the reality of Rikers is it's a crisis that's been a crisis in plain sight. Rikers has been open since 1932. So every injustice that's happening today has been happening. Although this year was the, the deadliest year, actually, since 2013. Because last year, when Rikers reached 16 deaths, they found that that was the deadliest year. And they declared it a human rights crisis. But now we're already at 19 deaths. So over the last few years, there's been a campaign to close Rikers that really sparked and got a lot of national attention after the death of Khalif Browder who was a 16-year-old who was wrongfully incarcerated at Rikers after being accused of stealing a backpack, who eventually took his life even after leaving Rikers. And so the plan to close Rikers, although flawed in and of itself, because the plan there is to replace it with four more jails, is essentially they've agreed that they would decarcerate Rikers. And that's really where we got our bail reform from those kinds of initiatives to lower the population at Rikers and also to stop the constant influx of people. But instead, what, do we, what we've gotten is actually just large fear-mongering campaigns 
designed and rolling back bail reform, which is actually directly linked to even the 19th death. The 19th death, um, the 39-year-old that was found dead at Rikers was only there for two months and he'd been incarcerated on $15,000 bail on a robbery that had previously made bail ineligible under bail reform, but they rolled it back in the most recent rollback. So it's a direct cause. These The fear-mongering campaigns are a direct cause of the continued rising deaths at Rikers. And the largest effort right now is to get a receivership, which would allow a nonpartisan expert to come in and temporarily seize Rikers until they brought it back up to constitutional uh, requirements, but they have yet to agree to do it, despite the fact that Rikers has been under federal monitor for about six years and has failed every check-in and deaths continue to rise. So that's where we're at. Yeah. And Scott, I mean, your thoughts too, right? You have been following this closely as as, uh, as as she has. And like, what are your thoughts, right? The deaths there, the receivership, like what does all of this mean? It means that it needs to be closed, that Rikers needs to be shut down, right? Like, um, there are thousands of people in horrible conditions in the heart of New York City, um, and they're dying. Um, uh, but beyond just the deaths, right? And like one death should be alone. Um, one person who's denied medical treatment um, should be enough to shut down a shut down an institution, um, especially one with such horrific history. But what pretrial detention really looks like, not just in New York City and Rikers Island, but, but nationwide is, it looks like predominantly black and brown people in cages, like something like 92% of those folks who are locked up pretrial, presumed innocent, are black or brown and only living in certain, certain neighborhoods. It's bail and pretrial detention is unnecessary. We know that when people are released, they overwhelmingly come back to court. And they don't get rearrested overwhelmingly so over 99% of the time for any crimes of violence. We know that that pretrial detention uh, in like in Rikers, like in other places, is um, it separates families. It makes it that makes it so that folks are left without caretakers. Folks are left without parents. Folks are left without uh, breadwinners. And it's also exceptionally violent. And so a lot of times we find ourselves talking in the... Uh, <laughs> talking in an echo chamber. And in, I think everyone should care about people dying. I think about things, things everyone should be caring about, um, massive num numbers of people, let alone massive numbers of black and brown people living in a place named after a famous white, northern white slaveholder. We should care about those things. But if you care about public health and safety, like I do, <laughs> you should also care about it because it's criminogenic. It's a fancy word to basically say the exact same characteristics of a place like Rikers or jails and prisons throughout the United States, that's isolation, shame, economic deprivation, and violence itself um, are the exact same drivers of violence. Isolation, shame, economic deprivation and violence. Um, so if you care about human beings, if you care about the responsibility of government to care for the people in its care, if you care about family separation, if you care about fiscal responsibility, and if you care about public health and safety, you should advocate for decarceration. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what I make of it. Yeah, totally. And, and I know you referenced those four drivers, right? I'm, I'm made to reflect on Daniel Sered's work, right, about accountability, right? Fear, shame, right? And ability to take care of one's economic needs and exposure to like constant violence that are absolutely and, and fundamentally are drivers of violence. Oh, no, man, I want to, Eli, man, I want to turn to you, right? Because as we're thinking about this, like with bail reform, you know, what's tied into all of this is, this idea of fear mongering and the media yeah. and its impact. And so speak to us a little bit about that. You and Scott, I know that's central to some of the work you do, right? Countering those narratives with facts rather than fear. Talk about the fear mongering that's happening in the media, right? How it's manufactured a lot of the consent that's happening in some way. I think it's one of the largest drivers to how we approach our entire legal system and our entire criminal system in actuality. Like during the midterm, something I, I noticed a lot, you would see uh, commentators or right wing pundits try to highlight, oh, black neighborhoods or black people uh, care about crime or when we did the polls, they, they care about the crime the most. It's like, yeah. 
everyone cares about safety. Everybody cares about crime. What, what's different is the response to it. And what you're teaching people is the response. What we do constantly in America is we convince people to feel afraid and they feel unsafe, no matter how divorced that is from the actual numbers. People who are constantly fair mongering to us about crime, all these articles are reading there. They're not living in the neighborhoods that they say are experienced the crime. They're not speaking from their lived experiences about crime. They're just constantly telling you, hey, we have a crime wave. Hey, hey, be scared. And to keep, keep leaning on these exact same methods that have failed because what I think is interesting and really always gets left out of the conversation is whether or not you believe that there are these crime spikes that they've actually found that pretty pretty much all the statistics and they've come out and openly admit this, especially on the heels after the midterms had passed, that there hasn't been this crime wave and this spike in violent crime or anything like that, despite how the media would have you think. Because actually nationwide, most cases are 80% of cases in our criminal system are misdemeanors, traffic offenses, are nonviolent crime, despite any of what they tell you. Um, but afterwards, they're, they're quick to point out, oh, actually, this was manufactured. But my thing is, it doesn't really matter whether or not the, the, the crime is being manufactured. What it really talks about is, I would like us to to view it from the perspective, oh, yeah, 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 let's say crime has spiked. Let's say we are continuing to feel endangered. We don't feel safer. Well, the only thing we've ever invested in and tried is mass incarceration. That's all we're currently doing. All the places that they're highlighting, like New York City, Chicago, everywhere that they're painting out to be Gotham City, those are the places that spend more money on policing and mass incarceration than anybody else. So if we continue to say we don't feel safe, crime is spiking, is that not proof of a failure on what we're currently doing? Yeah, Scott, your thoughts on that? Because, I mean, we're in New York City, right? And as it happens, right, some people maintain, at least in the media, that, right, there's a tremendous increase in crime in New York City. One of, but at least from what I've researched, right, New York City seems to want to be one of the safest cities in the country, right? Talk a little bit about that stuff, uh, Scott. So, so, so it is. It's one of the safest uh, cities in the country. And at the same time, whether or not it's spiked or not. I mean, if you compare it to the lowest of the lows prior to a once in a lifetime pandemic, the numbers are up. But it's important mm -hmm. to say like one person that's hurt is one too many, like violent crime, whether it's up compared to last year or down, like it's a problem, um, right? Like, and we need to and want to solve it. And so if we actually, but if, if we actually care about that, if we actually care about solving it, you'd think we want to follow data, facts and reason to actually get us to this point to Olami's point, not continue doing the same thing. That's not Solving crime. If you expect, if you you expect that you know spending the most in any society in the history of the world, we would be the healthiest and the safest society in the history of the world, and we're not. But it goes to facts, right? Like mm -hmm. on one side, we overlooked the really clear data and statistics that our current approaches to crime and public health and safety are not working, and we also um, we overlook the success of the small, modest changes and attempts to do something different that we've started to try and now have years worth of evidence. So if you asked, if I, I went, when we were fighting for bail reform back in 2018, 2019, um, continuing the fight that had been going on for decades. Um, and I had gone before the state legislature and I made a promise. I said, you know, three years out from now, I'm gonna be on this show <laughs> in December, 2022. And I'm gonna be talking about this law. And you know what I'm gonna tell them? And I can guarantee this that in New York state, 183,000 people about that, now it's close to 200,000, are gonna have avoided uh, the possibility of Rikers, so they're gonna be ineligible for bail. New Yorkers, you're gonna save over $650 million in unnecessary pretrial caging. And less than 1% of people are gonna be rearrested for a, a crime that's deemed violent with the understanding that 86% of all violent crimes ultimately are either dismissed outright or dropped to misdemeanors, I would have been laughed out of the legislature. That's a dream. Like that's, that's a ridiculous thing, but that's bail reform and not just in New York. That's, like, that's what it looks like in Harris County, uh, Houston, Texas. That's what it looked like in Los Angeles. And so if we actually care about these things we claim to care about. If the police and prosecutors and county executives and the GOP and New York City mayor actually cared about public health and safety, they would be screaming from the rooftops. We gotta have bail reform everywhere. We gotta have decarceration and we have to have more investment in community because that's evidence is like, wow, this is really working. And so when we think about these things, right? I noticed Scott, you're using um, the term public health and safety together, right? And Oftentimes it's used separately. Talk to us a little about, you know, each of you, right? And, and like, what do we mean by public health and safety, that relationship between the two? And 
Elijah, maybe you can take that, or Scott, or whomever. But That's again, Scott. I notice you're using each of those things, and it's important for our audience to understand the relationship between the two. So yeah. talk a little about that, Scott, and then we're going to turn back to you, Elijah, May, for some other things. I think I think about what we deem the majority of what we I would even say all of what we deem as criminal, at least what's what's really enforced as criminal today as as public health issues. Um, they are when we think about the end result of, of an arrest um, and something someone doing something um, as a public defender and having met thousands and thousands of people over the course of nearly a decade who are criminalized, who are targeted. I learned so much more um, about who's being brought in and why they're being brought in. It's not because they're bad or evil. It's because of things like lack of investment in infrastructure, lack of education, lack of investment in public uh, mental health resources, in affordable housing, in, um, in uh, uh, restorative justice, in um, anger management, in opportunity, right? And so what we find is those, those it isn't this is the safest communities. This is definitely not <laughs> the first time it's been said. I'm borrowing from a lot of different people, but the safest communities are not the ones with the most police, prisons, prosecutors, carceralism. It's, it's those with the greatest resources. And it's true. Um, and I want to make clear that, yes, the vast majority, as Olaimi said, of crime, the stuff that's actually enforced, are misdemeanors. And misdemeanors are crimes ordinarily of poverty, of health, of houselessness, of trespass, petty larceny, um, uh, stealing public transportation, crimes of desperation. But the violent crime, too. By, by the last five years, I was basically, you know, the, the small minority of cases total, but the folks that I was representing, uh, there's a sense that, you know, violence comes out of nowhere and it comes from inside, but it's a product not only of community, but it's also a product of being um, the survivor of violence uh, yourself. Most of the people I represented who harmed others had been harmed themselves. And so I think health and safety um, go hand in hand and, and um uh, I think we all should want both. <laughs> and, Eli, and, I just want to, and I want to turn to you, too, because, you know, when you think about larger cities like New York City and others, right, you see some similarities, right, in how people like are, are functioning, right, in those spaces, mm -hmm. with black and brown people. And as Scott said, like, you're not talking about bad people. There's not some genetic basis to people's like behavior, right? There yeah. is environment. Talk a little yes. about like nationwide, right? In large cities, why do you see these things happening, particularly among black and brown people in some way, in terms of crime, et cetera? To me, first of all, you see what you put a magnifying glass on. At the end of the day, if you only criminalize particular populations, you know, if you only uh, criminalize certain groups of people, that's where you're going to see criminal activity. It's not that you don't see the exact same things in, in, in the white world. Like We have to have a conversation about what really crime really is. If you watch TV, what they what they'd have you believe is in the criminal system, it's just not reflective of what it really is. In actuality, you just have regular activities. People getting into it with their roommates and calling the police. Moms wanting the police to, you know, have a stern talking to with their son, so they call the police. People banging on the doors and their neighbor do neighbor's door, so they're calling the police. All these regular activities that would never be, they would never be received criminally, they would never be reviewed criminally if you saw it happen to white people, if you see white people do it. It's the way the other day I was in Williamsburg and I saw two white boys their friends obviously drunkenly decide making an executive decision that they are going to fight on the corner and their friends are like watching just yeah like let them fight let them hash this out there's no way if two black guys made the same decision outside of the bar in brooklyn in new york city nypd is going to arrest them so it has nothing to do for me about whether or not you uh, you're seeing these things in certain communities it has everything to do with how we choose to receive it and that's a reflection of a criminal system that is really built on the backs of black and brown people because there's a difference when you see let me give you a perfect example. Bail reform is so controversial in New York City. It's controversial in Chicago, right? But it wasn't controversial in 2014 when they got rid of it in its entirety in Jersey under Republican Governor Christie because it has everything to do with who they're policing. Despite the fact that we, you know, we can create these red blue issues or, you know, think, oh, the South is this way and the North isn't. In places like New York City, despite the fact that we, you know, we go around like we're a progressive utopia, look at this blue, blue city, we have almost 10 million people in the city, 42% of whom identify as purely white. But Rikers is made up of over 90% black or brown people. And it's been that way. This is a jail that has been open since 90. 
1932. Chicago, a place like Cook County, heavily, heavily segregated city, big urban city, big blue city, but in actuality, entire pretrial detention center and prison systems are made up predominantly of black and brown people. So it has everything to do with how the system, which, uh, how and who they're incarcerating and how they frame the narratives around them. And you know, what's interesting, we're learning more and more, right, in New York City jails in particular, and I would imagine, you know, by extension, this is happening throughout the country, we're seeing now that, you know, there's a mental health crisis, right, in many of the jails. In New York City, I think there is probably maybe over 40% of the people there have some mental health diagnoses. Like, talk to us, Scott, or uh, Aliyah May, about this, this increase, right, in people having mental health diagnoses, and what does that mean? I think if we have an honest conversation about, you know, mental health, I don't think we always had the the privilege just as a, as a larger society, both rich, poor, everybody in between to really recognize how much mental health is something that is important and impacts us all. But I think you realize even in your regular life, divorced from the criminal system, you realize most everybody you know seems to be struggling with something. Somebody's depressed, somebody's anxious, somebody's seeing a therapist. Everybody does have mental health issues, but those issues are compounded by lack of resources or what you're going through in life. Like I always say, and we laugh about it, but in law school, I was out of my mind because I was broke. I was so stressed out. It was the worst that I was handling any any problems in my life. How I was responding to situations is the least, the, the least advantageous way that I could respond to it versus how I would do it now. And it's because my life is in a different place. I have the resources, I'm in therapy therapy on a regular basis. And if people don't have that, if people don't have the resources, you're going to see every issue in their life is going to be compounded by that. So yeah, the majority, it, it turns out, first of all, m the majority of people in our criminal system are represented by public defenders. And that in and of itself is worth acknowledging because that's not regular broke. That's not regular poor. That is destitute. I have identified as the broke and the poor for many, many years, and I wouldn't qualify for my own services. All right. So we need to recognize the vast majority of who America fuels in and out of its criminal uh, system is beneath the poverty line. They found that over 60% of people prior to arrest made less than $12,000 annually. So that's broke. That's destitute. So if you take those people, that sample size of the most uh, um, under-resourced amongst us, and you just give them those, the problems that come with that and all of life's regular issues and mental health issues yeah that's going to be compounded so by the time you realize yeah we're having a mental health crisis in the jails because we're having a mental health crisis all around the country all around everywhere but the people least equipped to deal with it are going to have the most the worst of it the worst manifestations of that yeah scott that, yeah that um you know these conversations that i have with folks who right now are really caught up in fear-mongering um folks in san francisco in New York City, in Los Angeles. And these are like, you know, it used to be um, there were there were folks on the right, like too far gone. But like increasingly I'm having conversations with like moderate Democrats who are like socially liberal and calling for like, like really just like calling for the, you know, arrests and caging of people in need on the streets. It's visible disgust that they have. And um, they just want it to be cleaned up. And these conversations I wound up having, stop, I've stopped like trying to explain and instead started to ask questions. I'm like, can we, can we acknowledge that folks on the streets who are living in the streets, like, um, uh, uh, you know, there's lots of reasons why they might have ended up there. And then get them to ask, they, okay, and if someone um, who's going through mental health crises or um, is, is, uh, uh, dealing with substance use issues or impoverished, destitute. Um, what do you think arresting them is going to, how, how do you think it's gonna make them feel when they talk about, well, like might be painful, it might, might hurt them physically to have cuffs put on them, it might be scary, it might make them feel anxious. Okay, um, and what, what do you think happens after they're arrested? And if they don't know the answer, I talk about the fact that they're held in, in cages for a long time. I ask them how that might make them feel and then maybe held pretrial and at the, in the best case scenario, released right away um, with uh, an additional crime on the record or worst case held or, or caged uh, pretrial and then released um, without resources or support. And then I ask them, I was like, do you think that that process um, is going to make mental, like deter mental health issues? Do you think it's gonna deter poverty? You know, do, does, does policing, you know, and so I ask these questions and sometimes them saying it out loud makes them realize how wrong headed our approach is. And then, then they go to, okay, well, what, what else could it be? And what else could it be? Or like, what does it look like? And it's, it's I'll just, there's a, I think this, we can, we can talk about this more, but I think what's, what's amazing about that question 
is it goes back to what Alimis was saying about just this kind of culture of carceralism. And from the very earliest stages, from I got a seven year old, uh, Paw Patrol, uh, whatever the, the version of that was when I was a kid, um, we're taught that police and prosecutors are the sole answer to all of our public you know, health issues, public safety issues. And um, we're taught that there are good people and bad people and that people make choices and some people make good choices. And if you make bad choices, there's consequences. Um, and, and, and it really plays out in these conversations where it's so hard to get people mm -hmm. to imagine different. They're so locked in. And then you add the news media that's constantly bombarding them with sensationalism that like what seems so obvious, if you just like think a little bit more clearly to me, <laughs> um, is so hard to imagine. And, and the, there's answers. The answer is like, what do we do? Um, you know, we already talked about some of the most obvious ones, just invest differently um, into the things that are actually going to prevent or, you know, from actually happening in the first place or, or resolve or solve uh, the underlying issues. And I know, Scott, you've been like approaching some of the way in which you communicate your work with asking people questions, which I think is a, a really effective means by which of educating people rather than just telling them that this is what it is. Because oftentimes people, when you explain things to them, because of the way in which they have kind of like hardened their belief, it's, uneasy, it's not easy to get through to them. But asking them a question and letting them answer it themselves sometimes gets people to understand things differently, which I think is really effective. And what we're going to do, obviously, we're going to transition now and we're going to close out the show. But we certainly thank uh, Scott Hetchinger and Alaya May Aloran for joining us. She's smiling because I pronounced her name correctly, as I should have. <laughs> right? And so we want to thank them both. But we're going to be joined by them again for part two of this 2022 year in review around criminal legal system reform. And so we want to thank you all for joining um, and we thank you, the viewers, for joining all of us. And in the meantime, on behalf of the Fortune Society, we thank you so much for tuning in to both sides of the bars. Um, if you're interested in finding out more about the Fortune Society, please check us out at fortunesociety.org. That's fortunesociety.org. Or you can type, find us on Facebook by typing in Fortune Society. This is Andre Ward. And as always, I appreciate you for joining us as we critically look at both sides of the bars. <laughs> <laughs>